So, Corey, I want to get your perspective. In, in the U.S., the, 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 the approval for this is agnostic to PDL1 uh, status. Uh, that is not the case uh, across the ocean in, in, in Europe, where the, there, there is some language. And if, if you could just walk us through that analysis that was done. So there was done. Uh, is a hypothesis generating uh, <laughs> sub analysis uh, as part of this trial uh, that analyzed PDL1 status. And I realized. Um, just a bare majority actually had tissue that was sent for PDL1. A significant minority did not. And in this analysis, those who had absolutely no PDL1 expression, at least in the context of this trial, did not have a survival advantage. If anything, the trend was in the wrong oh, direction. Yeah. But confidence You're, intervals that were confidence quite intervals wide. were w wide. They overlapped unity. Uh, and uh, Europe has taken this to heart, uh, whether it's a clinical decision or a financial decision. Uh, the approval is restricted to PDL1 positive. I have to confess, I, I, I embrace this approach with enthusiasm, and anybody who's PDL1 positive, I have a certain degree of ambivalence in PDL1 negative. I will still offer it. If the patient and their family is uh, intelligent enough or well versed enough, I'll actually go over the nuances of the uh, um, the PDL1. So are, testing. are you are you are you you and others routinely checking PDL1 in, in this setting? Uh, increasingly, in part because of this trial, and in part because it may inform subsequent therapeutic decisions if right. they uh, develop disease progression. Yeah, I, I have to agree with Corey. I think he summarized some of the reservations I had initially with the Pacific trial. I mean, ultimately. It's billed as a real-world trial, which to my ears as a scientist sounds like an uncontrolled trial for at least 50% of it. That, you know, notwithstanding that, the overall survival advantage is compelling. Mm -hmm. But I agree. I mean, that subset analysis for me based on PDL1 expression, it's not that this comes out of the blue. We have time and again seen that PDL1 negative patients don't derive a lot of benefit from PD1, PDL1 checkpoint inhibitors. So this is in the context of that. And because it did cross, you know, one on the bad side of one, you know. Uh, there is a risk that there is some harm that might be present. So I think at a minimum, having that discussion with the patient in the context of a negative PDL1 test is what I routinely do and try to make it as understandable as possible, I think, to help navigate through that. It's also a year of treatment yeah. every two weeks. Yeah. It's a commitment yeah. for a lot of people that can be tough. And, and I, I do want to make sure we talk about the toxicity too, yes. right? Um, and though compared to many of our cytotoxic chemotherapies, certainly immune-based treatments in general are pretty well tolerated, but these are not, I'm giving Dervalimab is not without the potential for long-term toxicity. I have never prescribed as much thyroid replacement hormone until I started <laughs> giving, you know, immune therapy. Uh, I completely agree, <laughs> right? yes, yes, um, and, I completely agree. And that's agree. not a toxicity that's going to resolve, right. right? And so these are, there are some significant long-term issues and especially if someone has the toxicity and then still has a recurrence of disease which we still know is going to happen maybe not in the majority but certainly very close to that and I mean as we look at those survival data and the disease-free survival it's it still probably is going to be most of the patients at some point recur though the cure rates are increasing and are increased and I think that's what we're also enthusiastic about with this trial and I certainly offer Dervalimab to my patients who have gone through concurrent chemo radiation, but we have to have those discussions and, and look, and if there are predictors where maybe someone's not going to benefit, we need to continue to look for that so that we're not giving people this long-term risk. But, but mm -hmm. you, you would agree, I think, mm -hmm. that um, there were no surprises in terms of oh, yeah. and th and th I want to get Christian's mm -hmm. idea, uh, uh, thoughts on, I mean, one of the concerns mm -hmm. during the conduct of this trial was you know, immunotherapy, mm -hmm. pneumonitis, after radiation, pneumonitis. We, to your point, the radiation was not necessarily QA'd. Mm -hmm. uh, and surprisingly, the difference was not alarming. Uh, in fact, no difference in grade three or four. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. Um, we did not see high-grade pneumonitis with trivalumab. It is important, however, that you are aware that it could develop and that if you are seeing signs of pneumonitis, you know, you pick up the phone, call your radiation oncologist, try to figure out if the radiographic changes are in the radiation field to understand if you think it's driven by radiation versus the dervalumab because there certainly would be consequences. And then it's, of course, important to get treatment started for these toxicities if you see them developing. 
you know, so, so it sounds like we have consensus that, that people would agree that in the appropriate patient that this is a, a new standard of care. Absolutely, it's yeah. practice changing. Yeah. I mean, we went 25 years without a single <laughs> positive trial in this realm. Yes. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, Concurrent chemo radiation was their standard of practice in that entire period. So here's the million dollar question. What do you do when a patient relapses after a year? Let's say they relapse mm -hmm. six within six months of completion of Devolumab, or what do you do if they relapse two years later? So um, this is where I'm going to talk about EGFR again, because in my practice, <laughs> yeah. in my practice, I, I mean, this isn't theoretical. These are my patients who have come in and many of them, because of the nature of our practice, have had EGFR known mutations, have been treated with the Pacific Regimen, they got their concurrent chemo radiation, they've been on Dravalumab, they have relapsed, some of them, not all of them, of course, but as we would expect, some have. And then in the setting where someone's already had exposure to immune therapy, there's separate risks that can come into play when you're then challenging them with EGFR therapy. Right. And so I've actually had some issues where I've been concerned about giving osimertinib directly after giving um, Dervalimab or any other immune therapy. And so we've actually gone back to using a bit more of uh, erlotinib in that setting. So that's just something for people to be aware of is that there is some potential increased risk of pneumonitis with osimertinib in combination or directly after immune therapy compared to some of the other TKIs. Now, that's more in the kind of they're relapsing during treatment as opposed to, well, if it's been six months, I wouldn't be as worried about that. And if they aren't going to be getting a um, EGFR therapy or other targeted treatment, it, again, looking at the timing, but I'm usually going to give combination chemotherapy plus immune therapy for those patients right. if they don't have a driver mutation. Corey, your thoughts? If it's six months or more, I'll usually reinstitute immune therapy with the chemotherapy. If it's during it, I will go with chemotherapy alone, although I think that's still a testable question as well. Uh, and again, it's histology appropriate. Uh, chemo, uh, even if they had uh, previously been exposed to chemo, which they are, by definition these folks have gotten concurrent chemo radiation. Um, I think the point you're making about uh, immediately following uh, immunotherapy with a TKI in the EGFR positive uh, population, that's something that's certainly coming out in stage four and it's a, a growing concern in this population. Uh, only 40 or so patients even had EGFR mutation on the trial. and. Granted, their PFS, uh, uh, the hazard ratio was a bit higher. It was still on the right side of one. And the survival, we haven't even seen the forest plots right. for that group. So right. I have offered this uh, regimen to at least to, to EGFR mutant patients.